evening. Here we are at Wednesday Wisdom, and I say welcome to each and every one of you. We're so glad to have you here with us this evening. Wednesday Wisdom is all about gaining wisdom from that one place from which all wisdom comes from the Word of God. And so tonight we're going to turn to the word of the Lord and seek after wisdom. Let's, let's just pray together. I know that I've prayed throughout the day and today was a very, very special day because as I studied and as I prepared, there were seven young men who were in our sanctuary who were singing and worshiping and praying and it just invited the presence of the Lord in to the building so beautifully today and so to them I say thank you for praying today and making it an easy day for study in the house of the Lord Jesus we thank you tonight for the opportunity to come together and to study your word and to gain wisdom which comes from your word and so i ask you that tonight that you would just let each and every one of us receive a touch from the holy ghost tonight i ask you that you would touch lips of clay and you would speak through them i ask you that tonight god that you would touch every heart and you would touch every hearer and that we can grow together in your wisdom i ask it tonight in the lovely name of jesus christ amen at the beginning of may as i begin to pray and prepare for a direction of study for us on our Wednesday Wisdoms in June. The Holy Ghost just dropped a question down into my spirit. And that question was, after Pentecost, then what? So I prayed and I, I mulled on that and I thought on that and, um, I studied on it because, you know, when God asks you a question, it's not because he needs the answer. He already has all knowledge. He already has all answers. And I know that there are no questions in heaven because all is known. So I knew he wasn't asking because he was seeking after an answer for me. But I knew that instead he was asking me so that I would dig it out and I would find out what is the answer to this question. And so I started looking at the book of Acts. I, I was just sure that my answer was going to be just at the completion of Acts chapter 2. I was going to find the answer to that question. And I have realized that number one, it's a series that we're going to be talking about over the next, tonight and the next two Wednesdays. That, but um, as I started looking in the book of Acts, I was realizing, okay, they, after Pentecost, they fellowshiped with one another. They broke um, bread from house to house. They shared the gospel and they told others about Jesus. They prayed because just about every um, chapter in the book of Acts actually mentions prayer. But even as I was studying that and I was looking at that, I, I didn't have that settled peace that comes from when you know that you have actually found the answer that God was, God was wanting you to discover when he presented you with a question. So as is my custom, I went back to prayer and I went back to the word of God. And I 
Just ask God, Lord, I need you to reveal to me the answer to this question from your word. And I know that that's where the answer is. And so I'm asking the question back to you. I'm asking, after Pentecost, then what? Where do you want me to look? How can you help me to learn and discern what it is that you want to say to me about this particular question? And as I ask for understanding of the word, then the spirit just began to open the answer to the question. So I hope that I can share with you the first of these, these series tonight and help you to clearly understand what the Spirit revealed to me. I found myself actually back in the book of Exodus rather than in the book of Acts where I was sure that I was going to start finding the answer. And I found myself in Exodus chapter 24 where Moses is telling the people the words of the Lord and he is speaking to them and he's sharing with them all the judgments and all the words of the Lord and all the people answered the the verse says all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord hath said will we do and the chapter goes on a little bit and it says he Moses took the book of the covenant and he read in the audience of the people and they said all that the Lord hath said will we do and then this time they added these words and be obedient so at this point, Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people. And he said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord made with you concerning all these words. And at that point, the covenant was ratified. You see, in the previous time and period of time up to this chapter, they had witnessed the very many awesome demonstrations of God's power in freeing them from their bondage in Egypt. They, they had seen the, um, the plagues which had been sent to bring discomfort so that they could be on their path and on their journey to freedom. They had seen the miracles as God had worked a way for them to get all the way from um, Egypt to Mount Sinai in, in, um, in protection, protected under his spirit and in safety. And so now they, they've come to a point where that there, there have been a list of, of agreements here that were made or instructions from the Lord. And the Lord said, if you do this, I will do this. If you do this, I'll do this. And he made promises of the things that he would do for them and the way that he would bless them as individuals, the way he was going to bless them as a nation if they would follow after um, these certain things. Or if they did not, then here were the judgments that were actually going to follow if they did not do the things that, that he was asking and um, I believe that as he made, he made these promises to them of these blessings and that all that they had need of to be prosperous and powerful and dominant in, um, in their world. See, they, they had just come from 400 plus years in slavery and in bondage and in servitude for, toward Egypt. 
And so I'm, I'm sure that the prospects of these blessings and these promises, they were so huge and, and they were exciting. And perhaps it was that the um, agreement to enter into the covenant was based on that focus. We see that they made this commitment and as they made the commitment, they said, we, we will obey all the words the Lord has spoken. They said that we will obey, we will do them. They, they made that commitment, but then we see that they didn't quite follow through all the time. Maybe while that they were making the agreement to um, enter in to this covenant, maybe they underestimated the difficulty of the way that was set before them. Could it be that they overestimated their own abilities to live by the terms of the agreement? In Exodus chapter 19 and verses 5 through 6, we read, Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. This is God making a statement of his purpose in why that he was making covenant with them. See, everyone except Moses had spent their entire lifetime in um, bondage. They, therefore, they had a very limited scope or idea of the responsibilities that liberty would actually require of them. Someone else had determined the purpose and the direction of their lives at all points up to this moment. And up to, the, up to this point, they had very few, if any, opportunities to actually function in their God-intended plan of life. I'm sure that they dreamed, and I'm sure that they yearned, and I'm sure that they cried out to God for deliverance and for the freedom that God desired for them. But I wonder, did they stop to ever ask themselves if deliverance came, how they would use it? The Israelites had grown into a, a, a large nation during their time in Egypt, but they had not had their own land and been together as a nation. So although they had grown into this large nation, the generation of the Exodus was not equipped to actually administer the responsibilities of being a nation. The administration of a nation involves more than just governmental control or governmental maintenance. But instead, for it to be successful, a nation needs its citizens to function within its laws for the good of community. And as far as the building up of the physical properties, well, they had a labor force which had produced all of the beauties of Egypt. But these weren't the skills that God was discussing under the covenant when he was striving to make a mighty nation of um, a priest and a peculiar people which were special unto him. 
in Exodus chapter 13 and verses 17 through 18. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God, who? God, led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. See, in his infinite wisdom, God led the Israelites south rather than on the most direct route from Egypt to the promised land. He knew that they weren't ready and they weren't prepared to fight a war. He knew that if they began facing situations for which they weren't prepared, that it would only discourage and, and it would defeat them. We also understand that from this, there were many other things that God actually had for them before that they reached Canaan. There were lessons he wanted them to learn. There were things that he wanted to teach them. He wanted to prepare them because as they made this transition from bondage to freedom, he wanted to teach them and prepare them how to actually handle the freedom that they were getting um, ready to walk into. The promises that they were getting ready to obtain. Those things that had just been dreams of the future that now then were coming within their grasp and they were going to actually be able to lay hands on. He wanted to prepare them and he wanted to take all of those old things of Egypt and he wanted to cast it out and he wanted to set them free from the old ways of bondage so they would be ready to handle their freedom and know how to operate in it. So they needed some training and they needed some preparation before that they could handle their promise. Are you finding yourself in any of what I'm sharing with you thus far? Because you see, that's all of us. All of us have dwelt in that land of bondage. We all have great and precious promises from God. But sometimes God takes us by the south route or he causes us just to take that right corner turn when we could go directly from A to B and that would be the shortest route to get there. But yet he knows they're not quite ready to handle what awaits them at point B. So it might be the quickest route to go from A to B, but instead I'm going to turn them off to the right and I'm going to have them go over here and I'm going to have them take this curve and I'm going to have them come back because while we're over here on this path, I'm going to be preparing them on the inside. I'm going to be putting things into them so that they are ready to handle what's coming at point B. Because when they get there, it's going to be a place that I have prepared for them, for them to be my kings and my priests, my peculiar people. And I've got to work for them to do when they get there. I have promises I'm going to start bestowing on them. I'm going to start raining down on them. I'm going to start putting in it to their hands. And they're going to be able to reach out and grasp those promises. But before we get there, there's a little preparatory work that needs to be done along the way. You know, we use that term 
wandering in the wilderness. Sometimes we say that kind of like it's just a, just a whimsical meandering about. But we have to be reminded, as it tells us in Exodus chapter 13 and verses 21 and 22, that um, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. See, God was actually very purposefully leading them in the cloud and in the, in the pillar of fire. It wasn't just a meandering that they were on. It's my understanding in what that I am, what I've read and studied is that this journey could have lasted only two years. But very quickly, there were problems and attitudes and character flaws that begin to reveal themselves. In Exodus chapter 14, they accused Moses of bringing them to the desert to die. Then in Exodus chapter 15, there was bitter complaining at Mara. In Exodus 16, complaints about the variety and the quantity of food. In Exodus 17, again, they were tempting God about his provision of water. And in Exodus 18, there were so many disputes among the people that Moses was absolutely wearing himself out, judging their controversies. Now we know they couldn't go directly from bondage to complete promise in freedom until that these things got taken care of. We have to go out of here and we've got to go out and about and around because there are some things that need to be taken care of. We've got to get rid of the murmuring and the griping and the complaining. We've got to get rid of controversies between one another. We have to um, get over the business of if God doesn't do it our way in our time and the way that we suggested to him quite firmly to do it, that we are angry and we lash out at him and we voice our words and we voice our complaints against him. So see, we couldn't go from A to B. We had to go around over here because there are some things that have to be cleaned out. When, um, when Moses, it talks about when Moses and the elders, it says that they saw God. And it says that under his feet, that it, it was um, as, as if a, a sapphire, but it said they looked on him and they saw him in his clearness. And I've made the statement before and I've shared about the experience that I had in prayer where I was allowed to see into heaven and I saw that everything was as if it was transparent and it was clear and the colors were so beautiful beyond description because the light from the throne was shining through. What, what does that say to us? It says that if we are going to be like God, if we're going to be and take on the appearance of heaven, that we've got to be so cleaned out of ourselves on the inside. And we 
we've got to be so emptied of ourselves that we become transparent before others, that when others look at us, there is an absolute transparency and they don't see us any longer, but they just see the almighty God in all of his clearness. And so we have to go out and around over here so that there can be some murmurings, there can be some complainings, uh, there, there can be some mumblings and grumblings, uh, and there can be some dissension and um, disunity and um, self, uh, selflessness, lacking in self-worth. Uh, and then on the other hand of that, a pride that lifts us up and makes us think that we are somebody that we're really not. All of those things have to be cleaned out so that when we get to that promise, we're no longer bound. Because you see, all of those things are still bondage. They are still a taskmaster that we are serving. And if we want to be transitioned from bondage to freedom, then we've got to go by the way of our knees and our hands lifted up and our faces lifted toward heaven and crying out and saying, Oh God, I just want to be set free. I want to walk in freedom. I don't want to be bound by the things of this world, but I want to be set free. We see where they were as a people, but then we we see, as I just read to you from um, chapter 19 and verse 5, what God desired for them to be through covenant. He desired for them to be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. That's what God wants for each and every one of us. He wants us to be a peculiar treasure. The word of God says that we're his jewels. You see, heaven's already decorated with all of those things that we call jewels. I mean, there's gates of pearl and streets of gold and walls of jasper. All the things that we think our jewels and our precious, those things are already there. They're just the decor, just the building. But he says, I'm going to collect my jewels unto me. Who are his jewels? You, me, those of us who love him and walk before him uprightly. See, the silver and the gold and all the pearls, all the sapphires, all the emeralds, all the rubies, those things, they're not nearly as beautiful to him as we are. Because he loved us and he died for us. Now, we understand that God is, is going to use this time between Mount Sinai and the crossing of the Jordan River to prepare them for receiving and living in their inheritance. That's what it's actually all about. What is, what is just so frustrating and sad, though, is that they were so ingrained with their slave mentality of Egypt. They were so ingrained to being in bondage that they never gave God a chance to really work with them. See, as I was studying this and and I was looking and I was realizing and it became so glaringly obvious to me that within two years after leaving Egypt, 
Those that were 20 and up had the death penalty pronounced on them. And why? Simply because they would not let God prepare them for the fulfillment of promise. How sad could it be if we stood in our own way and God was doing everything that he could to prepare us to receive the fulfillment of promise, but we were so ingrained in our old habits, in our old ways, in our old mindsets that we would not let go of them and we would not let God do what he wanted to do on the inside of us to prepare us to be able to handle the fulfillment of our promises. I read that it's estimated that they died at a rate of about 90 people per day over the next 38 years. Every single death was caused by people falling victim to their own lack of faith, lack of vision, and an unyieldedness. I'm going to repeat that because I want that to really soak in this evening. It's something that I feel like has been burned into my mind. Every single death at a rate of 90 people per day over 38 years. Every single death was caused by people who fell victim to their very own lack of faith, lack of vision, and an unyieldedness. Wow, what we can hold ourselves back from when we refuse to yield Amen. to the plan and the mind and the will of God. See, rather than trusting in God to have their back and to lead them for their good, they just consistently and impatiently second-guessed him right into their graves. Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 16 through 19 say, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? We've been very coronavirus focused for several months. And every day we're looking to the news and we're reading of the number of deaths and how many have died and where it, that it stands. But you see, we've got to somehow realize that the sin, because that's what the scripture just said, the sin caused their carcasses to be left in the wilderness. Amen. We have to realize that the sin of unbelief is more deadly than COVID-19. And yet, like a virus, it can be spread from person to person right. if we don't take precautions. Right. I'm standing here in a church building where we have groupings of seats for families to group together and sit here or an individual or a couple to sit here and some um, some seats that are crossed off and, and that say, um, thank you for understanding this seat is reserved for coronavirus seating or restrictions. We're taking a lot of precautions We've got our sanitizing station right back by the door. And when you walk in the door, you're, you're getting your hands sanitized before you ever really enter into the building. 
All of those precautions, people wearing their masks or staying socially distanced, because we realize and we understand that this is a virus that can bring harm and can be deadly to some. But somehow, in some way, we've got to understand that we better be taking greater caution against the sin of disbelief than we even are against um, the spreading of germs from the coronavirus. We better make sure that we're right on the inside and that we're not taking our disbelief and through the um, moisture drops that come out of our mouth and spew out on someone while we're expressing our doubt, while we're expressing our disbelief and it lands on them and begins to affect them. We better be cautious about being that one that's spreading the virus. But at the same time, we better have some safeguards around us. We better be masked. We better have on our gloves. We better um, stop by the sanitizing station and say, cover me, oh Lord, with your blood. I want to be covered by you so that the um, moisture drops of the doubt and the disbelief of others uh, does not uh, right. land on me uh, and be able to take an effect within me, but Amen. let me stand against it. Right. I don't want to die in the wilderness. Right. I don't want to die in a position where God is trying to transition me right. from bondage that I have lived yeah. in uh, right. all of my life. Uh, and he's trying to bring me into freedom. Uh, and he's trying to set me at that place uh, where promises are fulfilled and they're within my grasp. Hallelujah. But yet... I refuse to believe when I'm almost there. Jesus. And um, at 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, we read, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Speaking, of course, back to these children of Israel. In, um, in my Thompson chain, it says over here on this, um, on this left-hand margin, it, it reads, Life in the wilderness, typical of the Christian life. And then it says, or types of the Christian life. See, everything that they went through, it was for our example. It was the, um, it was to show us the way we look at their walk through the wilderness and we understand this is my walk as I am on my Christian journey. As I am a pilgrim on my pilgrim's progress. The giving of the law was celebrated at the Feast of Pentecost. And then once again, as the Feast of Pentecost is being celebrated on that day of Pentecost, some 1,500 years later, God poured out the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, after that we have received it, then what? Like the Israelites at Mount Sinai, we've only just begun. They had just begun. When, when we receive our Pentecost, We've only just begun. We have just walked out of bondage and we have entered into freedom. And so now we need to know, how do I make this transition? In 2 Corinthians 
um, chapter 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in to them. See, like the Israelites, we also have been enslaved by an invisible, deceitful, powerful master who is the God of this world. The, um, the culture of this world has been created and designed by the enemy of our soul to appeal to our self-focused and self-centered natures. The Lord just talked to us in one of our six o'clock prayer meetings about the fact that we had to get rid of the self-centered, self-focused, and we had to become God-focused. That we had to realize our identity in who we were and that our identity is in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter our upbringing, our background, our social status. It doesn't matter any of those things. Because above and beyond all of those things, our identity is in Christ Jesus. And when we become God-focused, then we find our identity, which is in Christ Jesus. The world bombards us with corrupt music and literature and entertainment and art and false religions and they come and they bind our spirits. The appeal of the desires of the flesh and the eyes and the pride of life, they enslave our minds and they enslave our emotions. The enemy, the God of this world, he brings confusion to us through hidden or shaded truths. Denying absolutes, distorting reality, and causing such a, a, a spectrum of just a variety, a, a, just a spectrum of opinions that just begin to assault our minds until the disagreement and disunity are just the standard operating path of life. He puts competition among us and begins to pit us against each other so that we'll remain defensive and insecure and untrusting. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came to set us free. Amen. He came to strip away all of that bondage right. that the God of this world has sought to enslave us in. All of the confusion, all of the disunity, all of um, the hidden truths that are now brought to light because Jesus Christ has come and he has lighted our way and he has shined on our path and he has illuminated it before us and he has come to set us free and we like the Israelites in our freedom are called to a place of covenant this new covenant it grants us repentance it remits our sin it washes it all away it allows us to be filled with his spirit and it gives us a better hope Amen. if you remember our study on the book of hebrews it gives us everything better right. at the first feast of pentecost 
God had given the children of Israel freedom from bondage and slavery. And then he gave them the law to guide them in living. At the first feast of Pentecost in the New Testament, the Holy Ghost was given to us for guidance in our newfound freedom from sin and slavery. Amen. In Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16, this is as the instructions were given under the old covenant of how to um, of how to live free. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And then we parallel that to Acts chapter two and verses two through four. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What, what a parallel when the Lord begins to give instructions for how to live free. When the Lord begins to give instructions for actually living and enjoying life, having life, being alive. We hear there are thunderings and there are lightnings and there is a mighty wind and there is a, a sound of many tongues and it all begins to break out and to break loose because when he gives us freedom and when he delivers us from bondage and he says here I am giving you your freedom I'm transitioning you from a place of bondage to a place of life and to a place of freedom then all of heaven sounds out and lets it be known here is one right here that I just set free. They are no longer bound and held in bondage. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The word for filling it here, I am not a Greek scholar. I don't know how to pronounce it. And so I'm just going to spell it for you. It is P-L-E-R-O-O. Pleru? I don't know. Which conveys the idea of growth to maturity or being molded by the word of God. Let me let me say that again in case my fumbling over the Greek kind of um, kind of got you stumbled back there while I gave the definition. But this this word right here it is actually a word that conveys the idea of growth to maturity or being molded by the word of God and. If we compare Ephesians 5.18 to Colossians 3.16, then um, we, we can see here that it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Um, 
right, right over here in Ephesians 5.18, it is be filled with the Spirit. And it is the same as um, right here in Colossians 3.16, where it says, let the word of Christ dwell, richly dwell within you. Ephesians 5.18, that is a present tense indicating a continual experience or process. See, both of those phrases, they have the same result. Praise and thanksgiving. That is the lifestyle of the free. The free walk about with praise. They walk about with thanksgiving. They, they're so grateful to be free. They sing the song, freedom. They sing the songs, I've been delivered. I've been set free. He set me free. Oh, yes, he set me free. They've got praise and they've got worship that is flowing out of them. Everything comes from a thankful heart. Because praise and thanksgiving is the lifestyle of the free. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, the, um, the word here that is filled is the one I'm wanting you to look at. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This word filled here is um, a Greek word which in this context implies an empowering for a work of service. So we transition from bondage into freedom by the work of the Holy Ghost infilling, which is doing two major things. It is empowering us and it is maturing us. We are thereby able to fulfill all of our God called ministries and giftings and callings. We are thereby able to fulfill the needs of the body of Christ. We are thereby able to step in and there is a gap here. I am able to step in and I am able to fill this gap. I am able to meet this need. I am able to serve here. I am able to serve there because the infilling of of the Holy Spirit, which has set me free from bondage and has brought me into freedom, is doing a work on the inside of me, and it is transitioning me away from bondage and into freedom. And as it does so, it is empowering me to be able to do the work of God and the calling of Christ and the things that he has called his church to do and he has asked of the bride of Christ he is empowering us he is also maturing us and maturing brings us on beyond our child like behaviors when I was a child, I thought as a child. I spoke as a child. I acted as a child. I threw fits like a child. But now the Holy Spirit has set me free from bondage and I am enabled to do the work of an adult. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, he said, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? 
This, this word, the Greek word that he used right here for temple, it means the innermost holy place of the temple where God dwelt. By Paul using this word for temple, he wants us as believers to understand that our bodies are truly the intimate dwelling place of the Most High God and of the Holy Spirit. In Exodus 32 and 28, we find out that on the day that the law was given, 3,000 men died that day. But when we look over in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 40, 41, we read that 3,000 people were saved on the day that the Holy Ghost was given. The law, that old covenant, Right. It brought death. Amen. But the new covenant oh, that the Spirit brought life. Amen. We see that balanced out there. We see that this covenant into which that we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ brings life. And it brings it more abundantly. Amen. Amen. You see everything that we have need of? He said he would supply. Right. All right. That didn't just mean that our electric bill is due and he's going to help us make sure that our electricity stays on. That didn't just mean that groceries were going to be in our cabinet. But he said, everything that we have need of, that means the chains that have held us in bondage, that we have need of being broken off, he'll do it. Those, um, those things that are around our ankles, and they've got the ball attached and every step that we take, it feels like we're dragging a metal ball with us. He says, what you have need of, I'll do for you. I will break it off. I will deliver you from bondage and I will set you free. Amen. So we understand and we know that the Spirit brings life. Amen. So now we're back around to that question that was asked. After Pentecost, what then? And today, the answer that I have for you to that question is, allow your Pentecost to transition you from bondage into freedom because that's what Pentecost does. It sets you free from bondage and gives you newness of life. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you because you have talked to my heart tonight. And so I trust and I hope and I believe that you have talked to others. And I just ask you tonight, God, that you would help us to walk on the path of deliverance, of transition from being bound to being set free, from going, God, from a place of darkness and walking out into the light and into the sunshine of your love. And I ask you that you would make us ready because we are getting ready 
to step in to that place where the promises are going to be placed within our hands and within our grasp. And the fulfillment of promise is at hand. And so I thank you tonight that we can come to Pentecost and we can experience Pentecost, but it doesn't just stop there, but it just gets better and better and better as we walk in the freedom that your spirit affords. And we thank you for it. And I ask you to bless each and every person that has been a part of this service tonight in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>